We are still on topic 12. We want to talk about organic foods, a couple other things, and finish off talking about uh, genetically modified organisms. And uh, hopefully starting topic 13 today, which is on mother and infant nutrition. Uh, just looking at where we are, I think we're in pretty good shape to wrap up by the end of the semester, no problem. Uh, last few units are kind of, you know, about one lecture each. Hoping to have a bit of time at the end to talk about the exam. I think my uh, my goal is at some point, maybe next week, I will try to talk about the exam. Uh, so you have lots of ideas about where to go from there. Uh, that's the plan anyway. So if I don't get to it on Wednesday, please remind me and I'll try to talk about it on Friday. I just have to have time to think about it myself as well. Uh, okay, so topic 12. Um, we had finished off here just talking about pesticides and uh, a couple of things to say about pesticides were that they're all different chemicals. Some of them come from natural sources, some of them are synthetic, some of them bioaccumulate, some of them do not. Um, and so it really is a mixed bag. Uh, some of them are extremely nasty, uh, DDT being maybe one of the most famous historical nasty uh, insecticides that um, it's basically banned in, I think, every country in the world except for one. And uh, anyway, lots could be said about DDT. Uh, it's in your blood. That's how bad it is. It's been banned for a long time, and it's in everyone's blood still. So it's, it's it bioaccumulates. Uh, so people are obviously concerned about pesticides. And I mentioned there's lots of formulas and things like that, products you can buy, methods for soaking your produce and all of those kind of things. And, and um, biggest thing you can do is just wash them with water. A uh, little bit of soap's not too bad, uh, kind of depends on what it is. I'm not, if I buy blueberries, I'm not going to be scrubbing every little blueberry, but an apple, it's not a bad idea to just, you know, rinse it and then dry it off with a tea towel or something like that and, and uh, you know, those kind of things. But here's some ideas. There's lots of uh, websites that will give you ideas. Like I said, sometimes the ideas are contradictory in terms of, you know, soak in vinegar water, soak in baking soda because one of them is acidic, one of them is alkaline, so it's the opposite thing, but maybe they both work, I have no idea. I've never tested this kind of thing myself, but lots of ideas on the internet, but water, not a bad idea. Um, yeah, and, and some foods, like I said, it's probably not a big deal. If you're removing the peel off of your mango, then that's not, you know, who cares? There's no pesticide in the inside or not very much that's gonna penetrate inside. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about organic foods. Um, Organic foods are uh, generally, they kind of mean they're not using some sort of synthetic pesticide, but what does that mean? Uh, it means there's a list <laughs> of what is acceptable and what is not for organic foods. So a lot of people think organic foods mean no pesticides, but that's not necessarily the case. It means that they don't have synthetic pesticides of which are found on a certain list of you can use these ones and these are the ones you can't use. Uh, but Organic foods is also a little bit of a philosophy, and you can see there's kind of this list of general principles about being sustainable, protecting the environment, recycling resources, uh, and, you know, depending on who you ask, that could mean all sorts of different things. Um, turns out that organic foods are now regulated in Canada. Uh, different provinces sometimes have slightly different things going on. Alberta only really accepted regulation very recently. I think it was 2019 or something like that. So now if you say your food is organic, uh, you have to uh, meet a huge list of criteria. Just see there's a question or a comment here. Let me just take a look. Somebody just got in for some reason, Zoom would let me join the class. Oh, okay. That's a question or comment, but um, anyway, uh, so I'll show you what that list looks like. Uh, but like I said, it's you can almost think of it as a little bit of philosophy, and a lot of it is definitely good intentions. Okay, um, but when you get into the research in terms of you know is it actually better, this is where it kind of gets a little bit of wishy-washy in terms of you know those kind of things. Um, so in Canada, there is a a federal legislation, I guess it is, and then the provinces, like I said, some of them have their own little things going on. Uh, but this label here is the national symbol for certified organic food in Canada. If you're in BC, they have their own little BC thing. In Alberta, I don't think we have our own little Alberta thing. Uh, at least one of the other provinces had their own thing. I can't remember which one. Uh, and 
there's a whole list of things. It was actually really hard for me to find a really good succinct list because I was able to find these, you know, 47 page documents and things like that that went through all, and it lists, like I said, it lists pesticides that are allowed and not allowed and those kind of things. But this is sort of the, um, I guess, condensed list of what is basically not allowed, right? So a detailed list of synthetic pesticides. Uh, they're not allowed to be genetically modified, which we'll talk about that today. They're not allowed to be irradiated. You're not allowed to use sewage sludge. So sewage sludge basically means human waste used as fertilizer. And I know lots of people are like, what? But we use animal waste, right? And there are ways to process human waste to make it into um, a very rich fertilizer. Um, whole other thing you could get into on that, but, but that's not allowed for organic food, basically. Um, around drugs, antibiotics, hormones, and those kind of things, um, most uh, hormones are banned for animals, not all. So there's, again, a list. Antibiotics, you're talking about regular use is not permitted in the feed, but you can use it to treat a sick animal. Um, so there's kind of a list of, of those, but generally those things are reduced anyway, drugs and hormones and whatnot. And, uh, and there's, there's a few other prohibited substances, uh, things that can be put in fertilizer and whatnot. I don't really know a lot about fertilizer soil science, but if you hit all these criteria and your food is verified by independent, I guess, verifier, I don't know, you can't do it yourself. You have to hire somebody to have your food verified, apparently. It has to have 95% or better organic content, right? Um, that's a pretty good bar, anyway. So that, that's what organic means in Canada. Um, which is kind of an eye-opener for a lot of people because I think a lot of people have different ideas, particularly around the pesticides, right? And uh, some people, it means that, that, you know, chickens have to be free-range or not, and, and that's not on the list, actually. In terms of how you treat the animals, it's not on the list. It's, like I said, the philosophy around being sustainable and environmentally friendly is kind of there, but how you do it, sometimes implementation is different on, on different farmers. Uh, so here's the question. Should you eat organic? Can you afford to eat organic? It's <laughs> the other question. So I'm gonna play this short little video for you and we'll talk about it for a couple of minutes. And uh, anyway, it's, it's a very good question and I don't think the debate is gonna go away. Uh, but I'll play this one for you. Um, let me just say, I, I spent way too much time trying to find a good kind of, how shall I put it, balanced video on this kind of thing. Um, if you type in organic foods on YouTube, you will find these, I don't know what you wanna call them, food warriors that are like, you must buy organic. It is the way to save the planet. It's the only thing to do. And, you know, I mean, or if you find farmer advocacy groups that, you know, talk about feeding the world and those kind of things, trying to find something that was a little more balanced was, was a bit of a challenge. But I found this one was pretty good. Um, this is by Nutrition Bite, by the way, and they have a, they have a podcast. And if you're, if you're really fascinated by nutrition and science, um, it's actually one of the better ones out there. It's pretty good. But they have this, this little blurb. So I'll play this for you right now. Like I said, this is the kind of thing where definitely views get pretty polarized. And um, <laughs> I find organic advocacy groups, they're, they're, very, um, they're very passionate, right? We'll just say that. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll play this for you here. Have you noticed how many more organic food products there are now compared to a few years ago? While there can be many reasons for why people may choose to eat organic foods, many do so because they think organic foods are safer, more nutritious, and taste better. But is the extra cost worth it? If you are health conscious but live on a tight budget, should you eat organic? Let's find out on this episode of Nutrition Bites. One of the biggest concerns people have about conventional or non-organic foods is pesticide residues and their effect on health. In the US and Canada, there are strict regulations for the maximum allowed level of each synthetic pesticide based on the available research on their safety. These regulations are in place for fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy products, grains, and some processed foods. While organic produce is grown without the use of synthetic or man-made pesticides, the use of organic or plant-based pesticides is still permitted. The downside is there's not much research available on the safety of these organic pesticides. In comparison, you can reduce the amount of pesticide residues on your food by up to 90% by simply washing, peeling, and cooking them. Also, so far, there has been no long-term studies on the health differences of people consuming either predominantly organic or non-organic diet. 
It's been reported that 72% of consumers believe that organic produce are more nutritious, but a study published by scientists at Stanford University looked at levels of nutrients including protein, fiber, magnesium, ascorbic acid, calcium, iron, and beta-carotene, and potassium, and found no overall difference between the organic and non organic foods. But it's also important to know that when it comes to produce, other factors can also affect the nutritional content of food, such as soil quality, temperature and light, planting and harvest dates, soil type and storage. What is true is that organically farmed poultry and dairy products contain higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which may help to lower your risk of heart disease. A common belief is that organic produce tastes better, but is that true? When consumers did blind taste tests for organic and non-organic foods without knowing which ones they were tasting and they were asked to rate how much they liked the foods, it turns out that no difference was found for lettuce, spinach, arugula, mustard greens, tomatoes, cucumber, onion, bananas, or apples, but it did seem like people preferred the taste of organic yogurt better. Interestingly, when being told that a sample of yogurt was organic, consumers reported that it tasted even better than it did before, which just goes to show that perhaps food labels have more of an influence on our preferences than we thought. The good news is not choosing organic will not be harmful for your health in any way, so it's really up to you to decide whether you want to spend extra money. There are many other ways to eat healthy without eating organic. Both organic and conventional fruits and vegetables need to be washed thoroughly before eating to ensure they are clean and safe. And be sure to choose a variety of foods that are healthy and balanced to supply your body with the different nutrients that it needs. Please subscribe for more new Unmute. Okay, unmuted now. Um, so lots to think about there. And I think one of the key things, right, is there's a lot of long-term studies that have not been done on organic foods. And um, it just highlights the number of variables that go into all of these things around foods, right? How can you compare organic carrots with organic, let's say, eggs, right? You've got chickens and carrots, literally. Um, very different animals, very different practices. And never mind, I mean, I don't know who here has ever raised a chicken, but there's probably thousands of ways to do it. My parents raised chickens. They fed them scraps. You could feed them corn. You could feed them wheat. Um, I don't know half of the stuff that they're eating. What about feeding that chicken organic food versus non-organic food? Is that going to bioaccumulate? I mean, there's so many questions that could be asked about this. Um, generally, the one thing most people know about organic is it costs more. And that's true. In Canada, 20 to 40% more is the typical thing. Um, but not always. Uh, sometimes, you know, you go to Sobeys, organic strawberries on sale. They seem to be better. They look fresher. Um, generally, there seems to be a little bit more promotion around organic products, probably because they cost more. But I also find when I go to the grocery store, they always seem more attractive, right? Sometimes they have a nice little ribbon on them or something like that. And uh, there's tons of food psychology studies that show that things that are packaged nicer taste better, whether they do or not. We think they do anyway. Um, generally less pesticides, but they're not going to be not going to be absent entirely. And like I said, the long term studies are really where the questions are. And uh, it's really hard to compare pesticides because each of them are very different chemicals. Um, probably better for the environment. Again, uh, there are studies that show kind of depends on which practice you are actually talking about um, is better for the environment. Some are and some are not. Some organic farms are actually more water intensive. Um, and so that's a big deal, right? Water is a precious resource, right? Um, so there's lots to be said about organic foods. I think the long-term studies are, um, are not there yet. The short-term studies show that health-wise and nutrition-wise, um, there's probably no difference. Um, but anyway, lots to think about here. The last thing on the note there is there is some indication that some foods might be better to buy organic than others. Um, there's this, uh, I think I've got the list here, let me see. Yeah, there it is. So the Environmental Working Group, um, annually they publish a list of the dirty dozen, so the worst foods to buy natural, and then the best ones that you probably don't need to buy organic. 
And you can go through their website. I haven't really taken a careful look at their methodology and all those kind of things. I know there are some people that criticize what they do and say it's not scientific. I have no idea. Um, but they publish this list and uh, a lot of it makes intuitive sense, right? Things like strawberries, uh, how do you wash a strawberry, right? Um, you can rinse it, but I'm not gonna scrub it. It's gonna you know, squish the whole thing and all that. Um, a lot of the things on the right are things that you might be peeling uh, and, and whatnot. And anyway, it's, it's something to think about in terms of um, uh, doing your foods, uh, but there is some indication that this might be the case. Some foods might be more worth it to buy organic than, than, than other foods anyway. Uh, but I'm, I don't think this debate is gonna go away for a while. And um, like I said, it's kind of hard to criticize when, hey, you know, it's probably better for the, for the environment. Um, so not a bad way to be moving, right? And you can see that billions of dollars, right? We've got grocery stores, entire aisles catering to organic products and whatnot now. And, uh, and, and here we are anyway. Um, the last thing I was gonna say, I think I said last day was that um, really the way things are right now with the number of people on the planet, we can't feed the planet without pesticides. Um, so maybe this is a way for us moving towards that, right? Figuring out better ways to uh, increase our yields of organic products and things like that. And, uh, and maybe, um, you know, maybe we can do better in the future. Um, I see your hand is raised. I don't know if I would be able to hear you. Um, so if you could put you your comment or question in the, uh, in the chat box, that would be, that would be better. Can you hear me? Let's see here. Um, yeah, sorry, Monique, I, I don't, I don't think I can hear you if you're talking, but put your comment or question in the chat box. Uh, what else were we going to say about organic foods? So that, that's kind of about it. Like I said, it's kind of an interesting um, uh, thing to get into. Uh, I, I, we used to have an environmental health course here and, uh, you know, every other year somebody would, would get into doing their uh, research project on, on pesticides and or organics and whatnot. And, and the amount of um, kind of interesting tidbits to dig up is interesting. But like I said, one of the biggest things is that we really would love to have more data. And just shows you how complex this is. Like I said, trying to compare organic strawberries with organic spinach, never mind all of the other possible products and farming practices out there. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, there's a lot that could be said about foods and processing and um, can't get into everything with food processing, but there, there's a lot that's done with foods. And we do add other things to foods uh, in many cases to do all sorts of things. Uh, often one of our goals is to uh, preserve the food, right? Um, and so there's a few things that can happen to the foods. One of the biggest things, important things that we're talking about obviously is contamination of pathogens. That's probably the biggest risk to food safety. Uh, we don't want a whole bunch of people getting sick and having some sort of epidemic on hand. Um, but other things can happen to foods. Foods can spoil just by exposure to oxygen. Um, and foods have, uh, sometimes they have their own um, enzymatic processes internally that actually cause them to degrade, right? So, uh, you know, tomatoes, for example, is a good example of that. Um, if, you, uh, if you farm tomatoes, um, and if you pick them when they're red, they only have a shelf life of a few days uh, because there's, there's, they have their own enzymes that actually cause them to ripen faster and eventually spoil. So usually when you have tomatoes, if you want them to last a while, you might pick them green and then eventually they ripen. My parents used to do that and ripen them in the windowsill. I guess the sun helps, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not a tomato person myself. Um, so many technologies, we're not gonna go through all these things. Um, there's as many technologies as there have been civilizations out there. Um, a lot of them have been, you know, some of these practices as old as ever, drying food. Uh, drying out meat, for example, is an age-old practice that is uh, designed to basically uh, take away the water. And then when the water is gone, the microbes cannot grow. And so the meat is preserved a little bit longer. Uh, cheese making, right? That's fermented, fermented milk, basically. Milk, you know, how long does that last, you know, without a fridge, right? So you make your cheese and now you now it can last, uh, you know, I mean, depending on the type of cheese, a week, months, um, some cheeses apparently last forever, <laughs> some of these old cheeses and whatnot. Um, and uh, you can see pickling, adding salt, right? Salt, 
does the same thing. It sucks the water out, you know, making beef jerky. And then when there's no water, the microbes can't grow. And there's lots of more modern uh, things, right? So, you know, freezing, uh, something we didn't have access to hundreds of years ago. And uh, this, this modified atmospheric packaging basically means you suck out the oxygen and wrap it in plastic, right? So, you know, that's, that's what that means anyway. Um, we talked about ir irradiation and, uh, and pasteurization. So like I said, I'm not gonna get into all of these things, but usually a lot of food processing, this is one of the aims. Now, some of these things can actually take away or destroy nutrients. That's one of the other things that you could kind of look into. Uh, generally, um, if you're looking at nutrients getting destroyed, almost always it's vitamin C. <laughs> uh, it seems you do anything to these foods and vitamin C gets destroyed. Pretty much the only exception is freezing. If something is frozen right away, the vitamin C might be preserved, but you dry things out, you lose vitamin C. You cook things, you lose vitamin C. And there's a few other nutrients, but it seems to be always vitamin C is on that list. Uh, some nutrients are gonna be preserved no matter what. Kind of depends on which ones you're talking about. But that is something to consider with, with food and uh, which is why frozen things are usually recommended uh, as being something all, pretty much as equivalent as fresh things and sometimes actually better. If you think about fresh foods, they're picked, takes time for them to get to the grocery store and to get to your table. Frozen foods, sometimes they're frozen right at the source uh, once they are, are picked and clean. Uh, <clears throat> so on top of this, which is sort of in the same category as food additives, which is something we talked about like way back uh, assignment one. And this, this is sort of in jest. But saying without food additives, foods will taste less, be colorless, have no texture, no shape, um, spoil, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and, you know, and, and like I said, we could go into all of these food additives if we wanted to take us forever, um, but it's just worth it to kind of talk about them a little bit. There's all sorts of different reasons to have food additives. And interestingly enough, if you kind of look at food additives, uh, maybe the number one reason why you're adding them is taste. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's making things a little saltier or you're adding MSG to make, uh, bring out the, bring out the taste. MSG sort of, uh, brings out the, um, I can't think of what, what term you'd use. The savory taste, is that the right word? Sort of has a meaty, yeah, that's the word, umami, uh, um, taste of things, right? Um, that's kind of the number one reason, but, you know, you could talk about colors, you could talk about adjusting pH, uh, there's all sorts of things there. We're not going to go into all of those here. Uh, there is a list here in the textbook kind of just talking about some of them and a few of these things we touched on over the semester. Like I said, I'm not going to get into them in, in really any detail. Um, they are regulated food additives uh, in Canada. Um, food and Drug Safety Act uh, makes sense. People are consuming things. We want to make sure anything that we're consuming um, is tested and, and those kind of things. And uh, uh, one of the big concerns is sensitivities and allergies as well, right? And that, those kind of things happen once in a while. And uh, that's why things get pulled off the market sometimes. Uh, we are going to talk about allergies, by the way, next unit and the following unit. We're going to talk about allergies. We'll get into that. Uh, it's kind of something that I felt should have been earlier on in the textbook somewhere, uh, but it was not. Uh, in terms of antimicrobial agents, I wanted to point out the number one, number two things that are added are salt and sugar. Uh, so that's always kind of interesting. These are natural products, right? And uh, all they're doing is withdrawing the food from things. Um, so my mother used to pick blueberries, wild blueberries, and um, her practice would, you know, you put them in a ice cream bucket or whatever, and she would just dump a whole bunch of sugar on them, right? And that was the whole idea because that's what she learned from her mother. I remember at one point I pointed out, you're just freezing them anyway. They're not gonna spoil in the freezer. And she's like, huh, okay. I don't know, that's what my mom taught me to do, right? Was her response. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that's done in a lot of cases. And again, it's, it's changing the, uh, you know, the osmolarity of the food and, and affecting the, uh, the water available to the microorganisms. Uh, we talked about nitrites a little bit. Um, I don't remember when, we were talking about bacon at one point, weren't we? Yeah, so the nitrites, right? Um, why are we adding these? Um, there's also the nitrates, which are kind of a similar compound. Uh, nitrites are generally added for color. Nitrates generally have a little bit more to do with the meat curing process. Um, both of them can, can combine with amino acids and make, um, I can't remember what they're called, nitroamines or something. And that's the carcinogen that we're concerned about. Uh, but we add flavor or we add color, right? And, and look at this, right? You know, you look at there's some, um, some corned beef 
And, uh, you know, right away, my eye is like the one on the left, ooh, the one on the right, yum, all right, because we've been trained to want to like meats that are, you know, red, it makes them look fresh, and actually these will preserve, um, preserve the meats as well, right, and so this is why you see these things in lunch meats and sausages and and those kind of things, right? Like I said, the big concern is if you eat too much of this, um, you are increasing your cancer risk, uh, which is which is a big thing. But like I said, they're added in there. And uh, I think I had mentioned before, right? You know, I, I have concerns about the claims around these lunch meats and all that. And, and I see them all the time now in the grocery stores. I found this, somebody had a blog, which found um, pretty much the exact same product that I remember seeing in Safeway not too long ago uh, when we had Safeway. I'm really sad that Safeway's gone. They had the best bakery in town. <laughs> Where do you get good bagels in, in Fort McMurray now? Right? Yeah, they had great, great bagels. Um, anyway, enough about bagels. Uh, anyway, so this person is pointing out all of these comments they have on here, right? 100% natural. What, what does that even mean? Right? Um, you know, there's actually no food legislation around what you can call things are necessarily natural. It's from a pig. It's ham. Um, but this is the same stuff here, and uh, lots of people will turn their nose up at spam, yet it's basically the same pork, right? Um, but you can read her blog and, and see what she has to say about this kind of thing. But like I was saying before, sometimes these things stay natural because the nitrites are from celery salts instead of, uh, instead of synthetic chemicals. But it's still a nitrite. It's the same chemical. It's not changing anything. Um, and, uh, and you're eating lunch meat right? Don't, you know, kid yourself thinking you're getting something extra healthy out of the deal, right? Um, not all lunch meats are equal, right? Some are much saltier. If you're worried about hypertension, you need to worry about those kind of things. But there are, there are other things you can put on your lunch, right? Chicken breasts and things like that that are probably a lot better for you. But again, you know, some lunch meats are super cheap, right? You go to a superstore, get this big package of lunch meat for five bucks, kind of hard to resist that, have a, have a great sandwich, but just don't overdo it. Uh, antioxidants, um, you yeah, know, we talked about those. Uh, some of these antioxidants are, uh, are vitamins that can be added, right? So we were talking about vitamins being antioxidants uh, in the foods. And so why not add them to the foods, right? And not only now you can say your food is fortified for certain vitamins, but uh, in, in theory, it's actually helping, um, helping preserve the food a little bit as well. Uh, but anyway, not going to really, like I said, dwell on these on these uh, for, for too much. Um, there's MSG there. There's the word umami, savory, meaty, earthy, right? I can sort of picture the taste of it, but I, how do you describe taste, right? It's kind of like try to describe the color blue to somebody who's colorblind and can't see blue, right? How do you do that? <laughs> you just have to experience it for yourself. But it's one of the um, it's one of the kind of the five main tastes, right? You know, salty and sweet and sour and, and those kind of things. Um, some people have uh, sensitivities to MSG. I don't know too much about it. I, I just know, I remember people talking about it. And uh, um, there have been some studies in mice and like any of these chemicals, if you feed enough of it to a mouse, it will have health effects, right? If you feed enough garlic to a mouse, garlic is really good for you, but you, you can OD on garlic. You can OD on nutmeg. You can OD on so, all sorts of things. Pretty much anything is a toxin if you have too much of it. Uh, the question is, you know, what about normal uses of these things, which is always the question around toxicity of, of anything uh, when we're talking about human health. Uh, another thing to talk about um, is there are lots of incidental additives that end up in our foods. So our food is in packaging, right? Often that packaging is plastic. And so we often eat little bits of plastic because of that right? It's just, it breaks down. Uh, plastic, you know, maybe a long-lived product, but it is not forever. Uh, very few things are forever. So there are additives that end up in there just kind of by accident. A big one that's been, um, you know, it's been in the news a lot for, I don't know, 10 years. I feel like it's sort of, we don't hear about it quite as much now, is BPA. So I want to talk about BPA for a few minutes. BPA is, is uh, an abbreviation for bisphenol A. And it's a plastic additive. And um, when you get to plastic polymers, it gets really complicated. There are thousands of types of plastics. Um, but there's really kind of um, a few sort of common types. And bisphenol A is an additive that makes clear, hard plastic. So water bottles, 
uh, food containers. Um, doesn't have to be in those kind of things. I, I've got actually a, a picture of some products. Uh, it's found in dozens of things where plastic is found uh, for modifying the plastic properties. You can make plastic soft, for example. That's the phthalates, um, which is another additive we're concerned about as well. I'm not going to get into the phthalates. They make plastic soft and malleable, um, whereas the uh, BPA is usually found in, in transparent, but it's a hardening um, effect as well, right? So we want our plastic to do its job, right? Which can be many things. It could be piping, it could be toys, um, and it could be food things such as water bottles. It actually um, canned food, right? A lot of people don't realize that is actually lined with a very thin layer of plastic, right? Um, probably so that the metals in the can, don't, I don't know why, I don't know much about food canning. Um, it's found in cash register ink, right? So if you work retail and you're touching those cash register uh, um, ink all the time, um, you probably have a slightly elevated amount of BPA in your blood from touching that ink because it gets on your fingers and can actually get in your blood that way. Kind of crazy to think about, right? And, and so there's been a few recent studies done on that too, because uh, this is the question, are these people at higher risk, right? You know, you work at the grocery store and it's like, wow, I'm touching like a hundred of these things every hour. Um, you know, is this the risk? So this is where the controversy is around this. And uh, so uh, there's concerns about this. And there definitely are some studies that show in high levels, we're talking about some pretty serious concerns. There was a factory somewhere in China years ago that I don't know what they're doing, probably a plastic factory. And um, these men got exposed to really high concentrations of BPA, and then they ended up with all sorts of fertility issues. Um, and uh, it turns out that that's the thing about BPA. BPA is, um, it's basically a known estrogen mimic. And there's a bunch of studies done in animals, again, high concentrations where you, uh, you know, you treat, for example, some, uh, there's a famous fish study where they treated these fish with high levels of BPA in the water. And, uh, and all the males were suddenly acting like females, right? And uh, linked with all sorts of things like childhood obesity, uh, fertility issues in, in, um, in men, uh, um, early puberty. Uh, there's a massive, massive list of the potential harms of BPA because it is basically an estrogen mimic, right? That means it's gonna act in the body similar to estrogen. So if you have excess estrogen, that can have all sorts of effects, right? Um, so Canada was a leader here where they, in 2008, um, they banned BPA in baby bottles and baby products. Um, so good on Canada. Sometimes we are a little bit behind in these kind of things. And Canada actually, I, I don't know if it's at the same time or a year or two later, actually declared it to be a toxin. Um, and, and then other countries kind of fell into place and said, yeah, we should probably take this out of the baby bottles. And now you see pretty much any plastic product you buy, I see a sticker on them, or at least I used to. I haven't bought any plastic bottles or, or lunch containers recently, but those stickers were everywhere saying that they're BPA free. So they banned them, not just from bait. Well, they didn't ban them from other things, but other companies fell in line and said, we should take this, this out of our products, right? Um, so good on Canada. I'm, I'm glad they did that. Um, I have some concerns though. The question is, what are you replacing the BPA with, <laughs> right? Um, and it turns out these things, and it doesn't matter whether you're a chemist or not, but you can look at these things and you're probably thinking, so what's the difference? And if you look carefully, you can see the differences in, the, in these products. Um, but that's the question, right? Are these other things doing the same thing BPA does? Now, there's different reasons why you might use different chemicals, right? BPA uh, tends to leach out of plastic, right? BPS tends to be the kind of the main one that they're replacing it with. And um, it seems that it doesn't leach out of the plastic quite as readily. So that probably means people are getting exposed to lower levels. Um, but there's studies now in Canada that show, I think it's something like 85% of us have BPA in our blood and 70% of us have BPS in our blood now, <laughs> right? So the question is, what is it doing there? Um, hold on a second. I had, um, I thought I had a quote here. I don't have, oh, yes. Um, I do have a quote here, right? So what is the Canadian government saying? Um, it turns out that all the data seems to be showing that the normal levels most of us have in our blood are probably not having an effect. And this is based on a bunch of risk assessment and all that. And this is the statement from, 
from the government of Canada, and they're looking at what normal exposure levels are going to be for a normal human, how often you're exposed to pla pa uh, plastic packaging and those kind of things. Um, of course, the question is, like I said, what about people who are exposed extra, right? Maybe people who are working at a cash register and whatnot. Usually that's not kids, thankfully. Kids are the most sensitive, again, because they're developing and, uh, you know, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, that generally seems to be the case. Uh, but, of course, you know, there's lots of concern groups. So you've seen BPA getting banned. But like I said, my big concern is what are they replacing it with is the BPS. Uh, yeah, so... Um, here we are. So here's, what can we do? That's the next question. Okay, so let's take a look. Here's some suggestions, right? Don't use plastic if you have something better, right? Especially uh, these kind of things, uh, reusable water bottles. Um, people tend to like to leave these things out in the sun and whatnot, and, and it's heat that is actually going to allow chemicals to leach from the plastics. So if you uh, uh, have something like this, then uh, you don't need to worry about it as much. Um, oh, there's the note about the plastic. The other thing about heating, right? If you have um, your lunch and it's in a lunch container, um, put it on a plate before you heat it up in the microwave. Heat and plastic, right? This is the kind of thing we need to avoid. Uh, and lunch containers as well. I don't know if it's on here. Maybe I'll just see what else it has to say. You know, microwave food and glass or ceramic containers. Um, don't put your food, if it's hot, into the container. If you made some soup, you have leftover soup. Let it cool down first, and then put it in your plastic container, put it in your fridge, right? So heat is kind of not our friend when it comes to plastics and leaching, okay, of chemicals. And that's what we want to avoid. Um, and you can heat things up in, like I said, uh, there's all sorts of things you can use. The other thing, too, which I uh, didn't put on here, I think I got this from a website with suggestions, um, but the other big one is your, your lunch containers, right? Um, if they start getting scratched up, get rid of them, right? Uh, I don't know whether we should put an expiry date on them or whatnot, but uh, get rid of the old ones, especially the scratched up ones, because the scratched up ones are definitely going to have chemicals leaching out from them. And there's actually very good data from some, some mice studies where uh, I think it was actually, um, I think it was a University of Calgary researcher, and she noticed that one set of mice, again, the fertility issues, right? And the, uh, their plastic feed dishes and stuff were scratched up. And then, and then she literally did the experiment and said, okay, I'm going to take some fresh mice and uh, I'm going to scratch up all their water bottles and stuff. And then some, some are going to have brand new stuff. And, and, and she saw a difference and measured the BPA in their blood and all that. So that's something that definitely we want to avoid. But good luck avoiding plastic entirely. Seriously. <laughs> I was reading a, um, a blog about this, uh, this uh, woman or uh, she was a... Uh, um, a journalist, right? And, uh, and, and she tried to do a month with minimizing or try, trying to go to plastic zero was the goal, right? You know, I mean, so she had to find a wooden toothbrush, right? And something that the bristles were also not plastic, um, was trying to shop in bulk. Of course, they want to put everything in plastic bags. So she was bringing glass jars to the bulk food store. It was kind of interesting and funny, just talking about the, the lengths that she had gone through to try to avoid plastic and was just going crazy trying to do it. It was very interesting. But not to vilify plastic. Plastic is great for sanitary things, like I said, keeping out microbes and oxi oxidation of your food. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think we can probably do better. i probably use a little less of it. Uh, sometimes we add nutrients to foods. I guess we mentioned that already. And uh, for very good reasons, sometimes we're fortifying things. Um, people are drinking milk and the milk has vitamin D. So that's a good thing for us to have because we're in Canada where we're probably in the winter months not getting the sunshine that we need and so on. Uh, why you would add vitamin C to fruit drinks? Most fruit drinks have vitamin C, but I guess adding extra, I guess is, is not a bad thing. Um, but uh, you can see I found this orange juice. Orange juice has a lot of vitamin C in it already, and this has apparently three times the vitamin C, so great. Um, uh, probably one glass is more than enough you need for a day, but anyway, vitamin uh, and, uh, and other uh, nutrient fortification is, is pretty common. Okay, so let's talk about genetically modified organisms. Um, try not to go too crazy on this one, but uh, there's lots that could be said about genetically modified organisms. And there's a lot of terms that are used out there. We could talk about genetic engineering, we could talk about biotechnology, recombinant DNA, um, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and some of these things are general terms. Some of them are very specific uh, regarding the technologies that are actually used and, um, and so on and so on. 
So I'm not going to get into all of those details. Uh, you can always ask me anytime. But uh, generally, what does it mean when we're talking about something that's genetically engineered or a genetically modified organism? It usually means we are doing something in a lab. Okay. And I'm trying to be very specific about that because you can genetically modify organisms without being in a lab. You can breed puppies and you can breed them to all be brown ones and you are modifying the genetic traits of those organisms, right? Um, or at least you're controlling the genetic traits of them. Uh, so generally we're talking about some sort of scientist uh, using some sort of modern um, biotechnology kind of technique of which there are many. Again, sometimes people split hairs and say, this is acceptable and this is not, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll kind of get into a little bit of that. But generally, why are we doing this, right? Um, whole bunch of reasons, right? We're, our farmers want to have crops that are pest resistant. Um, that's a big one. Uh, if you can make some corn that won't be eaten by those, by those caterpillars, or if you can, uh, you know, make it so that, uh, you know, your, your sugar beets are not uh, eaten by certain types of worms and so on and so on and so on, right? So pest resistance is a big one. Um, sometimes we're, uh, we're trying to modify them to make them healthier, right? Um, I was just reading about a tomato that was made in the state somewhere and it has uh, something like 10 times the amount of antioxidants in it, right? And, um, and it has a, a juicier skin or something like that. I, I can't remember, but basically tons of antioxidants. That's great. You know, way more than are found in blueberries is what she said, but she turns out the scientist wasn't putting it on the market. She was just kind of doing it for fun as a growing in her own garden. Um, but anyway, uh, some of these things are on the market, some of them are not. Uh, stress uh, tolerance, that means things like can, can, uh, can handle heat or, or saltier soils and those kind of things. Um, notice I've missed number one on the list, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, that is the big one, the one that is done, which is one reason why people hate GMOs the most, is resistance to herbicides, right? So it's almost like not logical. It's like, what, you want to use more pesticides? Um, and that's not necessarily the case, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but that's the big one. That's kind of the number one um, modification that's done on genetically modified crops. Um, so all of these things, in theory, are good, okay, right? You know, good intentions and those kind of things, and uh, we'll kind of get into that. I noticed, actually, I bought, um, I bought some bread uh, recently. Maybe not recently, <laughs> 2019, back in 2019. Um, and I noticed it said non-GMO on it. I'm like, interesting. Um, yeah, okay. I, I don't usually pay attention to labels like that, but I thought that was kind of interesting. So, you know, this is a thing, right? This is a selling feature for some of these foods. And we'll talk kind of a little bit about that in a moment. Um, the question is, right, you know, what are the crops that are being grown that are GMOs? Um, a whole bunch of them, it turns out. Uh, this is a graph. Uh, you can see this is talking about common GMO crops in the U.S. Canada is pretty similar. We don't grow cotton in Canada. We don't grow papayas, but these are things that are on the, on the, on the grocery shelves, right? Uh, so the big ones are corn and soy, right? Those are kind of the big ones that are found pretty much everywhere. And if you look in your food products, how many of them have corn and soy? A uh, huge number. Potatoes as well. That's another big one. Uh, so probably you, you've eaten some genetically modified crops. And um, there's thousands of them in Canada. A number I found was 30,000. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but it was a number I found. And um, a lot of it is used to, to feed animals. Um, so if you're not eating the crop directly, you might be eating the animal that has eaten the crop, right? Uh, so there's, there's lots that we could set about that. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I just wanted to show you, talk about that herbicide resistance. This is the big one that is a huge number of genetically modified crops in Canada. And you can see the, uh, the products there, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, canola, cotton. And uh, these are, are, um, are part of a brand called Roundup Ready Crops. So I don't know if anyone knows about Roundup. It is awesome <laughs> and controversial and all those kind of things. But so I have these bricks at home, right? You know, they're on the ground and these weeds grow up in between, right? Oh, what a pain, you know, you can pull them out by the roots. The next day they pop up again. And so I go to Canadian Tire and I'm looking for something. I see this spray and it talks about it being environmentally friendly, et cetera, et cetera. And I try it and sure enough, it kills the weeds. Next week, they're up again. So someone suggests, why don't you try Roundup? So Roundup is a herbicide. And what it does is it actually goes down and somehow kills the roots. So 
So you spray these weeds and they're good for like most of the summer. So it's an amazing herbicide. And um, um, there is some controversy around it. There is some indications that it's a possible carcinogen. Again, this is one of these things that in high concentrations, there's good animal um, data to show that in low concentrations, eh, the data is kind of uh, sketchy. Uh, France tried to ban it and then changed their mind like a week later um, because politicians and scientists maybe weren't talking, I don't know. Um, but it is biodegradable. That's something that people don't know about Roundup. People are super critical of Roundup, but it is actually a biodegradable pesticide. Um, but so uh, this is actually owned by Monsanto. And that's another thing that where the controversy comes from because they are a company that have made PCBs, which are an evil chemical and they made Agent Orange and uh, they're, they're a chemical company, right? And they're out to make money. Um, so there's a huge corporate kind of thing around Roundup and all that. But the whole idea of what we're doing with this is you make your plant and the plant is resistant to the herbicide. So you can just spray the Roundup and it kills everything but your plant, all the weeds. And like I said, it's actually highly effective. I tried it at home uh, on my, my weeds growing up in the, in the cracks in the sidewalk and it worked really well. And I, I, I really didn't have to spray very often. I think twice over the whole summer is, is all I did. Um, and, and this is the whole idea. And again, talk to the farmers. I actually talked to farmers about this. And um, it's one of these things they love to hate because they're like, it works so well. But just going back to this slide, here's the other thing that Monsanto does is they have these crops, right, all patented. So you have to buy the seeds from them, <laughs> right? So they're, they're double dipping. They're making you buy their seeds and they're making you buy their, their, um, um, their herbicide. The seeds are expensive, but you know what, it works and that's why they're using it. And they're actually using less pesticide than they would in normal, kind of growing normal crops, right? So kind of mind blowing, what, you're using less pesticide? Are you kidding me? Um, but yeah, so, and, and there's been lawsuits and things around people, you know, using illegal seeds and they're worried about crossbreeding and these kind of things. I'm not, you know, again, not worth it getting into that, but this is kind of the big thing, right, around the herbicides. So I just wanna show you, talk a little bit about some of the, the controversies around this, right? Um, first is the big myth around pesticides. We're actually using less pesticides and there's a lot of good data to show that now that we're using less pesticides now than we than before using um, uh, Roundup crops, right? So that's that's actually a good thing. And like I said, the good thing about, um, about Roundup uh, is that it actually is biodegradable, um, which cannot be said about, about some other uh, pesticides. Uh, I wanna show you some, some things that are on the market in Canada that you have maybe eaten. Um, if you like papayas, there's a very high chance, percentage chance that you have eaten papayas. Um, these have been on the market, you can see, for almost 20 years, 2003. 20-ish um, years ago, papayas were having a crisis. Pretty much they were dying everywhere. And we're talking about, like, at, at one point, it was 99% of the papaya trees were dying from a virus. So they um, engineered it to be virus resistant. And now if you get papayas, and most papayas in Canada are grown in Hawaii, about 90% of them are actually um, genetically modified. These ones here, the rainbow papaya, I don't know much about papayas. It's been a long time since I've had one. I didn't realize there were different ones, uh, but that one is genetically modified. Um, a newer one, this one was actually um, produced in Canada initially are these Arctic apples. There's a few different versions. There's the Granny Smith, which is the um, the green ones, and there's the yellow ones, which are the golden delicious, um, these Arctic apples. There's an Arctic Fuji apple, and these have been on the market since about 2018, and, um, and they have extended shelf life, and they apparently don't brown when you slice them up, right? So kind of the bane of, uh, of, uh, of apples, right? They, they kind of get ugly when you slice them up and leave them for too long. Uh, how about this one? This one's interesting. This one I read about, like literally I read about this one 20 years ago. And um, it took this long, 2016, to get on the market, these, uh, these uh, uh, salmon that, um, I'm not exactly sure what they've done here, but, uh, and I don't know enough about salmon, but there's like different types of salmon. Like there's the Chinook salmon and the Pacific salmon. Is that it? I don't know. I don't know if it was salmon. Salmon to me is just on the plate of salmon. I never asked which one it is. Um, but they took, I think what, what they did is they took a growth hormone of the Chinook salmon and put it in the Pacific salmon. And, and so now this, this one here grows like twice as fast, right? 
Um, so there's some interesting things going on. This, these are all in Canadian grocery stores, and it's possible you've you eaten some. There's uh, uh, potatoes as well that don't brown as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the concerns about these things, right? Um, there is a, a, a huge amount of public distrust around GMOs and um, all the usual concerns, right? And, and, and this happens every time with new technologies. Um, and I'm a big believer in that we should not blame technologies. I don't believe any technology is evil or good, right? You know, um, it depends on how you use it, of course. But there are questions and risks. The big ones are, what about things like allergies or food sensitivities and things like that? And there have been stupid things people have done. Uh, there was one case where, I don't remember the scenario, but they were injuring food and using a gene out of, uh, out of the peanut plant. And of course, peanut allergies, come on guys, right? Um, let's, not, let's not go there, right? Um, what about other things, cancers? Um, what about environment issue, issues? You know, we release this genetically modified papaya into the wild and it's going to just take over, um, you know, Hawaii and, or, or something, right? Um, and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, there was um, a genetically modified corn years ago uh, that was associated with killing monarch butterflies, right? Um, and it turns out now that we, we, we don't, the, the, you know, the studies have shown that it may have been one of those things where the butterflies were dying anyway, and it probably wasn't the corn. That seems to be where the, the, the science has led us to. But at the time, it's such big enough now that if you see something that's labeled non-GMO, it has a little butterfly on it, right? There's a little butterfly symbol that's looking at that. So they, these are legitimate concerns, right? Um, but uh, it turns out that genetically modified foods are put through way more rigorous testing than your normal foods. And there's tons of actually interesting examples of things like that. There's a case where people were uh, uh, basically using traditional selective breeding techniques to, um, I think it was cucumbers, right? Cucumbers sometimes have bitter skins, right? And so they were trying to breed them to get away the, the bitterness or something like that. And it turns out it actually amplified some other toxin, but there was no testing done on this. Why not? Because it was done through traditional means. Whereas genetically modified foods, um, the amount of regulatory hurdles are huge. Uh, there was, um, I know a professor at the University of Guelph and they were working on making a genetically modified pig and 20 years of trying to get the thing to market and they just gave up, right? Trying to jump through all the regulatory hoops. Um, and they basically just gave up. It was kind of, kind of sad to hear about that kind of thing, right? And so, you know, the pigs all got euthanized and whatnot. Um, but here, here we are, right? There's lots of data show that these foods in terms of nutrition, um, some of them are better. Um, they're not making us sicker. Uh, in fact, there's lots and lots of data to show, at least from 20 years, that um, there's, there's no differences. And one of the good reasons why we know this is um, in Europe, a lot of European countries, um, politically and socially, genetically modified organisms are like the devil. <laughs> um, I, I kid you not. A lot of countries in Europe have banned them outright, and they're very strict about it. And it's one of those things where it's just culturally, um, there's probably some history behind it that I'm not aware of. And, and so are we seeing more cases of cancer in Canada than we are in Denmark, for example? The answer is no, um, since the advent of, of genetically modified foods. Um, again, you know, every food is its own thing, right? That corn that, uh, that was associated with the butterflies, it was taken off the market. Um, and Again, it could have been economic reasons. It could have been just political reasons where they're like, well, we don't want to be the people who are killing all the butterflies. We'll take it off just in case um, and those kind of things. But it's an interesting area to follow because, uh, like I said, again, we've got every product should really be judged on its own merit. And, uh, and some of these things are, are actually great, right? If you like papayas, this is why you can actually have a papaya nowadays because the, the species is almost entirely wiped out by this, by this virus. Um, if you're interested in podcasts, I listen to a ton of podcasts. Um, this is a, a good one. It's not a nutrition podcast, but it's a, it's a science one where they kind of like take an issue. So they've talked about things like gun control or, or um, uh, probiotics and whatnot. And they did one on GMOs and it, it, was, it was decent. We're not one of their better episodes, but they did go into some of the science, right? In terms of, you know, are these things, um, you know, are they helpful? Well, they'd be the food of, of the future. Maybe not on average, right? If you look at countries that aren't, aren't trusting them, um, maybe, maybe not. Um, where pests are present, uh, definitely they are helping. 
Again, like I said, talk to farmers and find out, you know, all of the stress they have worrying whether the crop is going to make it and how much of it's going to make it, what their yield is going to be 60% this year, 80% um, makes a huge difference, right? When pests are not present, um, it's probably not going to make a difference because pests are the thing that are, are taking away the food. Uh, what else does she say? Um, she talks a lot about, um, you know, some of the things are being developed, right? Uh, I was just reading about rice. I don't know much about rice farming. I've never grown rice, but apparently what you do when you plant rice is you you plant the seeds and then you flood it for a day or two and then you remove the water and then the plant grows. That's my understanding, right? So some parts of the world that grow rice uh, a lot naturally flood. So what happens if it floods and the rice plants get flooded for, you know, 10 days, then they die? Well, um, somebody had, I think it was in the Philippines, um, they had developed a variety of genetically modified rice that can tolerate being flooded for extra long. And so now it's become a really popular brand of rice there because people they're trying to feed their families, right? So that's that's a big deal. Uh, but anyway, interesting uh, episode there. Um, this is the one that's been talked about for a while here uh, and kind of goes back to some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, this is golden rice as developed uh, primarily by this guy here. You can see he made Time Magazine and, and um, he was looking at rice and realizing that rice is the number one crop in the world. Uh, the biggest uh, source of calories for many people in the entire planet. And it's not necessarily the most nutritious, right? You know, depending on the variety of rice, there might be a little bit of thymine in there. And it's mostly starch though, right? Uh, so the question is, can we fortify rice somehow? And, um, and so this is the project he went on. And there's actually a couple of varieties of this that have been developed now, but this golden rice, the idea was vitamin A deficiency is pretty common in developing countries, right? So vitamin A, remember, um, uh, is, uh, uh, deals with vision. And so this is actually a, a way to uh, help children in developing countries uh, develop eyes properly, right? We're talking about a preventable method of, of, uh, a method of preventing blindness, technically, right, by nutrition. So the, the rice plant makes vitamin A, actually makes beta carotene, right, um, which is a precursor to vitamin A. We can get that from carrots. Uh, makes it in other parts of the plant, but doesn't make it in the grain. So this plant has been engineered to produce the vitamin in the grain, and it's beta carotene. It's kind of an orangish color, and so you kind of have orangish golden rice, they call it. And uh, um, yeah, so that was, that was awesome, except for, again, the deep mistrust of genetically modified organisms uh, on the planet. Um, his primary market initially was, was, was uh, African countries. African countries are, of course, much closer to Europe. And culturally there, there was a mistrust of it a little bit more. Um, you're starting to see it rolled out in different places. They're growing in Puerto Rico. Um, they were growing in the Philippines. And here's the sad thing, right? You know, farmers are getting some free rice to grow. And believe it or not, some eco-terrorists went there and burned down a bunch of rice fields um, because of fear and mistrust around genetically modified organisms. Um, yeah, so this one's been around for a while and slowly getting rolled out. And, you know, it's, it's a new technology and there's a lot of, a lot of fear behind it. And a uh, um, couple of other things to think about, right? Uh, let's just talk about this, this here, right? Um, you know, you ask people how they feel about things, right? Um, and this, this is, you know, this is how people make decisions, right? We, we'd love to think humans are, are rational, but we, we're not. We, we make a lot of decisions on things, how we feel, right? So sister, how do you feel about these genetically modified strawberries? Um, well, these have not been designed in a lab. Um, these have been made through traditional breeding methods, right? If you've ever picked wild strawberries, you know, there are teeny tiny things that are amazingly delicious. And um, these big ones, if you look at the genome of these things, it is weird compared to the wild relatives. There's been some massive genetic modification that's going on, and it's all been by traditional selective breeding techniques, really only a couple hundred years ago. Um, so what is natural? These big strawberries we get in the grocery store are not natural. They cannot grow in the wild either. That's the other thing. Um, tons of products like this. What about watermelon? Who does not love watermelon? Um, if you take a look at the natural fruit, uh, apparently it's bitter, um, it's tiny, it's, you know, not that desirable. Whereas the modern fruit that we're getting, well, there's tons of varieties. They're, they're creamy, they're juicy, they're crunchy, you name it. Um, and they're, they're very, very different 
organism. Again, something that can't naturally grow in the wild. Uh, and it turns out many of our foods are like this. I don't know if anyone knows what that plant is. All right, that's a natural plant. And humans, over thousands or hundreds of years, have selectively bred it to make a whole bunch of things. This is all the same organism, right? Cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and all those other things there. Um, kind of like, yeah, these are not natural things, right? So, you know, when we talk about natural foods, um, what are we really talking about? That's kind of the question, right? Um, corn is a really interesting example too, because corn is, it, it cannot grow without humans. Um, and, and, and it was actually took people decades to even figure out what the natural version of corn might actually be. And it turns out, is this plant here, uh, teosinite, or te I'm not sure how to say that. Um, it's, a, it's a hard, tough grain that you have to boil. And I don't know why you pick it. It's very tiny. Um, and people of the Americas uh, long ago somehow took this and made it into this nice juicy um, thing here, right? Um, that can't be grown naturally and uh, is sustaining many people on the planet. Uh, and any food that we have that we've domesticated, you know, compare a modern pig to a wild pig. Um, they're smaller, they do grow faster, um, they tend to be less hairy. Uh, it's not the same organism anymore. So this is kind of, you know, some of the last thoughts around genetically modified organisms, right? In terms of, you know, what we're doing is not unusual. Humans take things and we adapt things. We're just using new technology to do it. And uh, we are right to question, you know, whether things are safe. Um, but, uh, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, whatever you want to say, because uh, I don't think all things are bad because of one technology. I think we've got to judge things on our own merit. Anyway, um, I think that's it for, uh, for that unit there. Uh, so I have the quiz open up and uh, that's quiz 12, it should say, right? Um, I was just, somebody just pointed out I had the expiry date on, on the previous quiz, quiz 11, done, I fixed that now. So if you've tried that and, and uh, it, it should be up and running uh, for, um, for quiz 11 and quiz 12 will be due on April 8th. Okay, 20 minutes. So I'll talk about a few things here. We'll get too far in the next unit. Okay, I'll just that one out. Oh yeah, let's talk a little bit about, um, about being pregnant. All right, you know, because um, this is this is something to think about, right? Some of you have been, or maybe will be someday, and um, you know this this is a it's a big deal, right? Growing a rapidly growing thing, right? That's going to suck a ton of nutrients out of you, and you want to you want to you know hopefully do it right. Um, so there's, there's a lot that could be said about that. Um, Again, some data for you, right? In terms of infant mortality, uh, I always find this kind of data interesting, particularly if you kind of zoom in on the last few years. Uh, we're actually doing better and better in Canada. Uh, we're down to 2022, about four uh, deaths per, per thousand children. Um, and uh, that's great, right? If you look at the Americans, they're about six. Uh, so we're doing better than the Americans. Um, unfortunately, this is not equal all around Canada. You can see I have a number there I found for Nunavut in 2012, which was about 21. Um, and um, why is this important? Because it turns out nutrition is kind of one of the big things that can be done to uh, help that infant survive, right? Low birth weight in particular is one of the biggest indicators of uh, infant mortality, right? Uh, and, and so if we can have a properly nourished child, you know, it's going to help them start off life and, and hopefully survive and, and do better. Um, like I said, I find this data interesting. You see those numbers the last few years, they, they're going down slightly too, which is, which is great. I'm not sure, uh, you know, what we've been doing so well lately, but um, this, is, this is good. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that could be said about this kind of thing, even before you're pregnant being healthy. Um, usually it's the mother. Uh, but we could, we could mention the father, uh, men who, for example, are obese, sometimes have uh, fertility issues. Um, and there are other things that, that may affect the, uh, 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 the virality of the, of the sperm and things like that. In fact, it was just released in the news last week 
uh, there is a, um, a, a type 2 diabetes drug. Uh, I don't know if it's in Canada, but they found out that it actually uh, it has some, makes some genetic damage to sperm, right? Uh, so, you know, nutrition of the father is important, but probably the mother a little bit more so because, of course, she's the one who's going to be harboring this, this organism and trying to nourish it for, for the nine months. Um, and so there's a lot that, that, could, that we're going to talk about in that particular category. But like I said, even pre-pregnancy, it's important to, uh, um, you know, to be healthy, right? Uh, both being underweight and overweight. The biggest risk, actually, believe it or not, um, is being underweight, right? You're not just going to make a baby, but there's a placenta and a bunch of other tissue that are going to go into this thing. So we're talking about, you know, the average pregnancy, I think it's about 35 pounds of stuff, right? It's going to include iron and calcium and other nutrients that are going to get sucked out of your body. And uh, if that placenta is not as healthy as it should be, um, it's going to affect the nutrition of the baby. And of course, that is, that's the, uh, like I said, the low birth weight is one of the biggest risks to child uh, mortality. And uh, so worth talking about, let me just take a peek at this next slide here. Yeah, I do have a, a risk um, uh, slide here. Um, being overweight as well, uh, sometimes can, can have effects. And I'll, I got that on the next slide as well. But this is what a low birth weight is defined as, uh, five and a half pounds. So that was me. I was less than five pounds when I was born. <laughs> um, so I was a high risk, obviously. I was, I was a month premature, right? So that's why um, that was the case. And, uh, and, and so I, I made it out all right. So I'm glad to be here, of course. Um, so just this is sort of a summary of some of the risks here. Uh, underweight, like I said, is the big one. And the low birth weight um, not only leads to higher possible mortality, but a bunch of other things, right? Um, sometimes having a, a slower start at the beginning leads to a, a smaller stature, um, sometimes lower IQ. Um, and uh, another one is just a higher risk of chronic diseases. So I don't think they fully understand this, but the, the, the idea is that the, you know, the infant in the womb is trying to compensate for the lack of nutrients, right? And so it becomes you know, hyper-efficient at, for example, absorbing fat. And so sometimes children who are low birth weight are actually higher risk of, uh, for example, uh, adulthood obesity and type two diabetes and things like that. Um, so there, there are risks there. Uh, risks of being obese, um, people who are heavier uh, can often nourish babies and the babies can be higher birth weight, which of course can lead to pregnancy complications, which might mean you need um, a C-section or other complications like that, other interventions. Um, the other thing about having an extra large baby, sometimes extra large babies that are born premature aren't recognized as that. And premature babies tend to have a uh, higher risk for certain things, you know, heart defects, jaundice, a few things like that. And, and it's not always caught with larger, larger premature babies, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and, uh, and, and it makes sense, right? Like, I don't know if, if anyone's ever been in a hospital and seen the premature babies. They are small. They are so small. I remember when my son was born, he was eight pounds, which is kind of a roughly an average weight. Uh, I think maybe slightly lower than eight pounds is an average birth weight, right? And... Um, had to go back to the hospital on day two or something like that for, I can't even remember what now. And they brought him in there with those premature babies. And it's like, holy cow, like they were so small. I could not believe it. It was, it was just incredible. Um, other risks to mom, uh, gestational diabetes. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, hypertension infections, things like that are all, all uh, higher risks for, uh, for people that are, are high birth weight. Um, so having a good start for the baby is, is important. And, uh, the biggest thing, of course, is the, the placenta. I don't know if everybody knows what a placenta is. It's kind of like this big sack of tissue that's mostly full of uh, blood vessels, right? And uh, what happens is that the, the baby has some blood vessels and the, the mom has some blood vessels and they run parallel, right? So the mom's blood does not mix with the baby's blood. Um, and that's good because if they're different blood types, it could be an issue there. Um, but basically the blood runs side by side and the nutrients from the mom's blood, so whatever the mom has eaten and gets into the blood uh, is gonna pass through that barrier and get into the child's blood, right? And so that's kind of what's going on in the placenta. So it's this massive amount of tissue and uh, much of it is blood. So it's going to require a lot of iron to, uh, to be built. And uh, it turns out like, I don't know, I was trying to look up some numbers on this and, uh, 
Um, the estimates anywhere are from 90 to 100% of women do not have enough iron to, you know, they're a little bit iron deficient um, to make a, a nice placenta, which is why iron is kind of one of the big recommendations for supplementation uh, for when you're pregnant. Um, but yeah, you, so you can see they're trying to show, like I said, those vessels kind of intertwining and exchanging nutrients. So like I said, the big thing is, and, and the other thing, of course, is waste, right? The baby isn't in there. It's not peeping or peeing or pooping yet, right? And it doesn't have developed kidneys. Um, it's not eating solid foods. So all the wastes are going out uh, as well uh, through this system. Um, what was I going to say about this? Yeah, uh, you know, we're not going to go into all the things about pregnancy. There's lots of risks. Uh, some of them are a little bit more obvious than others. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about smoking while pregnant, uh, but it's the same idea. You're putting stuff into your blood. It can get into the baby's blood. And so there's risks of, of all sorts of things. Some of these things we will touch on a little bit here or there. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to get into all of these, uh, all of these, these factors here. Uh, you can see this is a, a little chart showing when, um, when crucial periods of development are for different uh, uh, tissues. And uh, so a, per, a mother's nutrition um, and what she is eating and exposing herself to during these particular stages can have massive effects on the baby. And uh, going back to BPA, right? Um, there's at least one study that shows a mother exposed to high doses of BPA early on in here can actually lead to um, underdeveloped, um, underdeveloped uh, uh, genitalia in males and, uh, and possibly um, a abortion uh, of, of male fetuses. Uh, and, and it's kind of, there's some weird research done on this. There's, um, can't remember where the town is. It's somewhere near Sarnia, Ontario, and it's, uh, it's an indigenous community. And um, so they, they're kind of, Sarnia is famous for being Canada's kind of chemical factory hub, right? So whatever is going on in this town, they don't know. But something like four out of every five, five births are female children, right? So where are all the males? <laughs> um, they don't know. They figure they're getting exposed to something. Um, it's a big mystery at the moment, at least last time I checked on it. So early, early stages can affect all sorts of things. Um, so what are we going to eat? Everything. Everything on the plate and more for, with some pregnant women. Um, but we, we need to make sure you're well-nourished, right? Uh, and there's lots of eating guides for these kind of things, right? Uh, and um, it kind of depends on the woman in terms of what, where her circumstances are. Uh, you can see the, uh, the big ones here, right? Folate, calcium, and iron. And depending on the study, um, all of those things, at least greater than 80% of women are probably deficient. Right, so they need to be looking at getting more of those things in their diet, possibly taking supplementation uh, of those kind of things. But everything else is important. Um, I think uh, uh, your average pregnant woman, uh, not early on, but later in the pregnancy, needs somewhere around five or six hundred extra calories a day. Um, so that includes your carbohydrates and fats. It's also important to get those omega fats into the diet. So the brain, the brain is a whole bunch of neurons, and those neurons are made out of a ton of fats. And so we want the baby to have a properly developed brain, it's good to have those omega fats in the diet to, for the brain development part, right? Uh, protein as well, super important, uh, just for building a body, right? And so all those things need to be found. Usually, um, you know, if you look at the dietary recommendations around protein, for example, uh, we're not usually concerned in Canada about women getting too much more protein. Extra recommendations are like an extra 25 grams, but most women in Canada eat more than enough protein as it is. Uh, the biggest risk, of course, is if you were vegan and if you're kind of close to that recommended dietary amount to try to get the extra in there, the extra 25 grams uh, to, to kind of make sure you're in that safe zone. Because otherwise, the baby needs protein, it's going to start taking it from your body is what's going to happen. And, and it's a battle of, of who is getting what. And uh, for the woman, unfortunately, the baby often wins. If it needs that calcium, it's going to get it now, and it's going to take it from your bones if you don't have enough in your diet, right? Um, is kind of is kind of what is going on there. Um, carbohydrates are just just energy too mainly, right? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about calcium and iron and folate for a minute. You can see, like I said, here's a here's a what to eat and not eat while you're pregnant list, and giving lots of lots of suggestions. Uh, next day, we'll talk a little bit about alcohol and caffeine and things like that. 
Um, you can see some things on here. Uh, we'll, we've talked about a little bit already, like undercooked food. We don't want to be uh, having risk of listeria or anything like that. Um, and uh, you can see certain kinds of, of fish have mercury in them. Uh, so, you know, they say avoid uh, eating too much tuna and, and, and other large uh, certain fish that might have uh, high concentrations of mercury in them and so on. Uh, so here's a comparison of the recommendations, right? And so you can see a lot of them are just a little bit more. Some of them are quite a bit more. Um, so the, the scheme here is the green is a non-pregnant woman. <laughs> The, uh, the yellow is pregnant and uh, purple is lactating, so breastfeeding. And uh, we'll talk about that next day as well. But you can see that uh, in some cases, right, the, the, the breastfeeding woman actually even needs more, right? Because now you're not just feeding a fetus, you're feeding a full-size baby, right? And yourself and making sure it's getting, getting enough nutrients on there. Um, so like I said, I want to talk a little bit about iron and folate and calcium for a minute, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we did talk a little bit already about these prenatal vitamins, um, which are famous for having folate and iron in them. Sometimes they have other things in them as well. Um, but uh, vitamin B12 and folate, usually vitamin B12, we're not, people are not usually that deficient, um, but it, it, is, it is essential for building new cells, right? And, and uh, found in higher concentrations in animal, animal uh, foods. Uh, folate is the big one, and this is the one that is important for developing that neural tube, which is part of the uh, brain and spinal cord development. And uh, there's, um, I don't know much about this, this one here, anencephalophy. I think it's a fatal condition. I'm not sure, I have to look that one up if I remember correctly. Um, but spina bifida is the one that we talked about. And there's a picture in the textbook that talks about spina bifida. I thought I'd show that to you. And this basically causes um, some sort of misdevelopment of the, uh, of the spinal cord. And it can be relatively minor, to relatively major. Uh, apparently some people end up with minor cases of spina bifida and it basically leads to you having a bit of a bend in your spine. And apparently that's relatively common. Um, uh, to cases where people walk funny, to cases where they're, they're uh, basically in a wheelchair for their entire life. I've known two people with uh, severe cases of spina bifida. The one guy, uh, he could walk, um, but it was, you know, you knew there's something weird with him because he walked funny, right? Um, and another was a kid um, that I, uh, I, I knew, and, uh, and he, was, he was in a wheelchair, right? He couldn't walk at all. Um, so this is kind of the big one, and it's, it's usually preventable. And uh, you, you see this advertised everywhere. Oh, you're pregnant? Take these multivitamins. Take these multivitamins. It's, it's kind of really, really, uh, um, uh, uh, the education around this is, is pretty high, which is, which is good. Um, there are foods you can get folates from, right? Um, and here's, here's some examples. Uh, a lot of them are uh, a variety of different products out there, uh, but, you know, I, there's not really a, a trend to this. It's like not just vegetables or not just animal products. Um, calcium, I mentioned that already. This is for bones. And um, it, it turns out when you, when you first get pregnant, apparently what the body does is it increases absorption of calcium somehow. I don't know the mechanism behind that. It starts stockpiling that on your bones because uh, it knows you're going to need it because uh, once the baby starts growing bones, it's going to start sucking that calcium out. Uh, also starting to notice, you know, with uh, pregnancies, you know, um, dentists are getting in on this too. They're noticing the declining dental health when women are pregnant as well, probably for the same reason as well. Uh, magnesium and zinc, apparently needs are increased. Usually uh, deficiencies are less, a lot less. So iron is the big one though, right? Producing a lot of blood and um, the, the woman's body, I guess, again, somehow increases its ability to absorb iron. And uh, uh, from what I have read, it, it seems that a lot of women up to possibly 100% are somewhat iron deficient uh, for at least producing a fully developed placenta. Um, but anyway, um, good to have iron in the diet. So just back to this, I think we, I showed you this slide before. I added one other thing on here that I had learned recently is that apparently vitamin A is reduced in, um, in women's multivitamins for prenatal vitamins. Um, but then I went you know, back to here, right? And I didn't see any evidence of this. So that's why I put the word usually in there because uh, I didn't see any evidence of this from what I saw in the nutritional information. But you can see, right, we've got the folate and the iron. Those are the big ones. There is calcium in here, but it turns out that the prenatal one actually has less calcium than the, so I'm not sure what's going on, but calcium supplementation is one of those things that Calcium supplementation is not usually absorbed 
as well as getting calcium out of foods. Um, so there's some questions as to, as to how much that helps. Some of them have um, omega fatty acids in them and things like that too, to try to help out with the, uh, uh, the prenatal uh, aspect of it. Anyway, as promised, I'm gonna stop there. I was hoping to finish a few minutes earlier, but um, here we are. So thanks for coming. We will see everybody next week.